before we get started, uh, I just want to let you know we have a couple of technical difficulties. I can't uh, broadcast any pictures from my computer like we normally can. Uh, so normally I have a couple of extra displays in there. We'll put up a couple of easels as we get started with many, but so we can uh, I can see these photos a little bit better. Uh, but we thank you all for coming and we'll, we'll get started in just a second. Did everyone find any water that they needed? And I'm not sure which clock to go by. <laughs> the clock on the wall, I think, is set for Rio Virgin time. questions 
I'll start with you, Margaret. What was your maiden name? Sylvester. Sylvester. You like that close, huh? Sylvester. I, I, <laughs> and what, when were you born, Margaret? Uh, 1911. 1911. Uh -huh. So how old are you? 94. 94. Just, just young. Okay. Yeah. So have you lived in Mesquite all your life then? All my life I've lived here. So 94 years of Nevada history and Virgin Valley history and Mesquite history. Uh, you married who? Skipper Hardy. <clears throat> and was he born here in Mesquite? Lived yes. In Mesquite? Uh -huh. And uh, how many children did you have? We had six. Six. How many grandchildren do you have now? Uh, Twenty-one. And great grandchildren? No, I can't tell you. That. <laughs> There's too many. <laughs> have you ever traveled very far from Mesquite? Oh yes. Have you ever been to a foreign country? Um, just the Caribbean. And have you traveled in most of the United States? You figure in your life? Well, I have. I went on a tour. You know, that went clear around the United States. So you you've been outside Mesquite. Oh, yes. Okay. Look. Hazel, uh, what was your maiden name? Pulsifer. My name is Hazel Pulsifer White. Okay. And what was your birth date? Uh, November the 28th, 1918. And so you are 80... What? 86. <laughs> 86. <laughs> I didn't want to have to figure out. <laughs> and you lived in Mesquite all of your life? Uh, most of it. During uh, the Second World War, we were spent about six years. My husband worked for the government during the war, and we lived in Bomer City. But other than that, I've been pretty close to Mesquite. You lived in Nevada all your life then? Uh -huh. And you were born and raised here in Mesquite? Uh -huh. like Margaret. And your husband's name? Don White. Don White. Okay, and how many children do you have? Three. And grandchildren? Fourteen. Great-grandchildren? Great-grandchildren. Grand, have to ask Suzanne. Uh, Thirty. Uh, Suzanne probably knows. Thirty. Thirty-two or something. And we're still counting. <laughs> and have you ever traveled in a foreign country? Yes. Which ones? Well, we toured most of the countries in Europe in 71. Went to uh, Chile uh, several years ago. In Australia. Yeah, in Australia, New Zealand, and Hawaii, which is in the United States, but quite and a bit. Most of the, you travel around the United States quite a bit? Uh, quite a bit, uh huh. Okay. The reason I ask that is, is because, you know, a lot, some people never do leave this valley. I love to travel. Yeah. <laughs> I have my hat and purse ready if they do all the time. <laughs> uh, now, as I ask these questions, I'd like you to just speak out. Uh, I'm not, I'll, I, if one of you talks first, I'll ask the other one. You know, so. When you were growing up here in Mesquite, just back, let's say, 10 years old, so that for. What did you, Margaret? What were the roads like coming through? Were they asphalted? <laughs> there, there was a, a trail where the horses walked, and you know, you, they each made a, a little like furrow in the road, uh -huh. and then in the center there was the where the the horses did walk, <laughs> and sandy. You you could get stuck without even trying. <laughs> when you left town, why did you leave town? How did the road go through town here? Um, it went right up the river, it, you know, when I was a child. And, uh, and down the river. Okay. We didn't have any roads except on the river bottom. Okay. And the river bottom, was it clean or full of brush? It was clear. You could see across it, you could Way across the, the streams, it was uh, it was clear. Well, you know, just no no overgrowth in it at all at that time. 
Now, Hazel, you are <clears throat> about 10 years younger, is it? Is it 86, 94? Six or seven years. Yeah. So by the time you got 10 or 12, yeah, have the roads changed much? Yeah, I that fun. <laughs> have the roads changed much? Well, we have to grab the roads. I don't think we have had anything more than... By the time you were old enough to remember that uh -huh. we had graveled the roads. Pretty much. Of course, a lot of it was uh, just sand. I remember out our lane where I lived to catch the school bus, we'd have to dive through the mud. But anyway, uh, most the streets were gravel, it seems like. Well, when you went through, and I, I'm interested in this because <clears throat> when they tore down the old church, the, the Mesquite Church mm -hmm. down here, I've read lots of stories where that used to just be big sand dunes with mesquites and so and i've read how over here in mesquite that's basically where it was except where they'd leveled a field or where a house was it was just big clumps of mesquite and sand dunes do you remember any of that yes yes that's the way it was there were anything that wasn't uh, you know cultivated was, was mesquites and sand dunes uh how far down did town go when you it remember, went, uh, it went there to the where the river is. But down no, down but Main Street, did it go all the way down to your ranch? Our ranch, our lower ranch, was way down where the Casablanca uh, golf course is. So uh, it stretched that far. Okay, but was there houses all along? Uh -huh, that's where I was born. <laughs> I know, but was there houses uh, like there is? Well, quite a few the little houses. Or the, the Levitts had home there. Down on Levitt Lane? Uh huh. Margaret, where did you live in town when you was growing up? Where was your home? Um, it was right where the where the uh, Oasis golf or golf course is. Uh, yeah, on, on top of Uh huh. Um, but we were down under the hill. Okay. We were down in the down next to the ditch. Uh -huh. okay. uh, <clears throat> how many people do you think lived in Mesquite in your youth? When I, oh, there wasn't any more than 200. Do you think about uh, that, Hazel, no. when you were 10 no, years old? There were a few more, probably, when as I come along, three or 400, under 500, I think, till. Were there any other churches other than the LDS church in Mesquite? When you were young, it was uh, everybody was LDS except one family. And that was the Waymars. They moved in here, and and she was a very they're very religious people and good people. Mm -hmm. But they uh, they were not LDS. They were the only ones in town that was not. Was not. How about that? Uh, so when you went to church, where did you go to church? We went to the church in the schoolhouse. Where was the schoolhouse? Uh, right on the corner where of uh, this, uh, where is it? The station, the Mobile, where, where, where Mobile used to be. Huh? Yeah, right by the Golden West, cross street in the Golden West. Yes. Uh -huh. Today, where the uh, Tanner's place is. We held all of our church meetings in the school buildings because that's what we that's what we had to do. What was the school building made out of? Lumber or lumber? Uh -huh. How many rooms? Four. Four. Okay. And was there a bell? Yes. I, I down in this state center there was a big bell that they took out of the church when they tore it down. Uh -huh, and that's the one that I understand they moved it from the church you're talking about up to the elementary school that used to be there and then down uh -huh. to the yes so that bell's been around for a long time it sure has <laughs> is that where you went to church too hazel uh i don't remember going to church except at the school mm -hmm. uh on the school the elementary mm -hmm. <laughs> okay uh, i remember the old the white chapel of chapel or church that uh, but we haven't talked about it. I mean, it's across the street from 
Or was it about where the... It was uh, across the street from the schoolhouse. Oh, I'm doing all right. Just a, a white... I faintly remember that. It's just a white lumber one with uh -huh. that steeple. And At the steeple, that place. Place. right. Well, were there any stores in town? Oh, yes. Did you we had... Which ones? Jimmy Hughes had a store. That's not... Or Jimmy Hughes that we... No, know. it's his grandfather. <laughs> his grandfather. His grandfather. Great grandfather, maybe. And if you went in that store, what could you find? Anything you wanted. If you asked for it, they'd get it for you. <laughs> Did you find cold milk and ice cream and all that kind of stuff? No, they didn't have that. <laughs> <laughs> but but every, you know, it carried everything that they could. When did the Abraham, Abraham uh, A. Woodbury start his store? I don't remember it. Uh, I remember it early in my day. Uh, he, first, he had a little store in his home. Yeah, and his okay. home was up, up uh, next to. Uh, on the corner. Yeah. You know. Across almost that auto zone. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand that uh, Abram made vinegar. And he made all big barrels of vinegar that he would trade around town. Mm -hmm. And he's one of the first ones that started selling gasoline. He got yeah, 50 gallon barrel of gasoline. gasoline. <laughs> Finally, he started selling inner tubes and tires. His car started coming through. And too. Was there any other business establishments in the in town in Mesquite here when you were growing up, other no. than Jimmy Hughes' store and no. the Woodbury store? Yeah, that was the only one. Uh, I wanted to mention about the Woodbury store. Go ahead. Some of the experience. Uh, when I was little, uh, they had the best little candies, and we'd take our pennies or eggs, whatever, to get them. And uh, I remember going from, from my mother uh, to get some spaghetti, some noodles, or something like that. And uh, Uncle Abe reached up to get it, and a mouse ran out of it. <laughs> and then another time that he didn't want to sell a jar of something, and he said it's the last one he had, and he didn't want to be out of it. <laughs> it's funny, he was a nice, he was a nice, he really tolerated us kids. <laughs> You know, I, there was a bartering went on back then, wasn't there? I, I mean, so. you didn't have a cash, so you would trade eggs, so you would oh, trade. Yes. Oh yes, <laughs> you could. Uh, you could, if the kids wanted candy, you could give them an egg and send them to the store, and they'd get their candy. I remember <laughs> doing that. I remember stealing my neighbor's eggs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, today we go down the street, and you know, a lot of the homes and. Places have real nice yards. In your day, did they have nice yards or no lawnmowers or things? So, no. <laughs> what were the yards like? Not very homes? many nice yards. But they did have nice gardens and orchards and things gardens, like that. Uh, no. Everybody, everybody had a garden. Yeah. When we lived down on the ranches, uh, we had the irrigation. A lot of irrigation water, and we had oh, I said quite a nice little lawn. Uh -huh. How did you mow it? From the sheep loose? Uh, uh, could be. Uh, we, us kids, might have just wore it, wore it out. <laughs> but I remember, you know, no bush lawnmower that was really an antique. But I remember seeing an old, old picture of your house with a big haystack behind it, kind of off back in the back mm -hmm. there. They were loading hay, had horses pulling big yeah. hooks of hay up on that haystack. Uh, <clears throat> did they keep their corrals and things close to the house, or did people tend to keep their animals away from the homes? No, they were they were too close to the house. We had so many flies. <laughs> <laughs> was there a lot of trees in town, though, so it was shady? And Lots of cottonwoods. That's the first thing they did is, is plant cotton right down yes. the street. What was the first automobile you remember? Well, uh, we could hear it. <laughs> you know, we, uh, we were up on the ranch and we all ran up on the hill to see what it was. And lo and behold, it was an automobile. <laughs> Coming through the sand. Coming through the, the river. It is oh. right on the river bottom. And, uh, and we watched it till it 
it'd go through one stream and then on the ways then through another stream and <laughs> Cross the quite, river. it was quite exciting. What did you think? Is that the first car you've ever seen? I think that's the first car I've ever seen. You ever heard of cars before? Uh, yeah, we had heard of so them. So you knew what you was looking at. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be really you know, exciting to see something like that and not know what it was. When did you first see a car, Hazel? Well, by the time I come along, my dad had had one or two cars. So he he had one fairly early. You was born right in the lap he, of luxury. He, he, was, he was tired of driving a team of horses and the buggy and everything. Uh -huh. um, so I kind of grew up with different kind of cars. Well, Margaret, when you were young and in your home, did you have a radio? When did you get your first radio? Uh, it was about in the 50s. 1950? 50 something, I can't remember. Before you got a radio? Uh-huh. We went upstairs and, and bought one. <laughs> and that, that was really, could entertain the kids then. <laughs> How about you, Hazel? Can you remember your first uh, radios in the home? Quite early, I thought. I was still just a kid in school when I used to come and watch. At least some. <laughs> Comment? No. Oh. <laughs> uh, I can't remember. I uh, it would have been in the early 30s, I think. When well, if it was. It was a battery. No, no, battery. I mean, battery uh -huh. Power didn't come for. Oh, no. Yeah, so. They were batteries, and seems like it, they. We how, used about, the, how about phonographs? Oh yeah, the wind-up phonograph. You had those before the radio? See, I had an older, two older brothers and a sister, uh -huh. older than me, and they, they had to have everything. <laughs> the Remember my sister? The, the Margaret, did you ever have a photograph in your home growing up? No, I don't. I did uh, later. Later, but not. And so if you wanted music, you just sang. <laughs> Well, very good music. <laughs> <laughs> How about telephones? Well, she could tell you about the telephones. Her dad was the one that brought it in. Well, he was one of them, the, the pioneers. So the telephone, how did, how did you start it off, your dad? Well, he started with several other uh, people in Gunlock, uh, father-in-law, and, uh, and so that uh, Mesquite and Bunkerville and Littlefield was connected up there, and he didn't think that was enough. He thought that we should be connected up with St. George, with, so we'd contact doctors. Uh, and he invested a lot of time and materials building it up, and. He just eventually you know, took it over. But there was not a, when you when we talked phones, there was only to start with no. one phone in Mesquite. Uh, it was just well, in a central I, place. It was in several businesses, several service stations. Or, yeah, I, I when I remembered, I used to work at the telephone office, and there was about ten. About ten phones uh -huh. in Mesquite. And then they were they were on party lines. Right. That's made me feel real old, Margaret, because I remember part of this. Shark Certainly. ring and a long ring. Yeah, our ring was long shark. Yeah. But I, I remember that they used to, uh, reading how at first there was one phone in Bunkerville. And if you want to use the phone in Bunkerville, everybody had to go to that home. It was the home of Jim Abbott. And in, in Mesquite, there was one phone, and then finally one phone in Littlefield. And then they started getting other phones in Mesquite. You know, as people could afford them. But uh, it wasn't like just all of a sudden today you get a phone and everybody's got three or four phones in the room. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was rather pathetic for a long time. <laughs> the phone line was draped over fence posts and through the bushes. And Even they really round. worked hard on it. I, uh, I think that they <laughs> I, I, I read where they even uh, Levitt when he started from Bunkerville, even uh, just used bottles as the insulators on the ski coaches. Could be. Uh, when did you go to your first movie? 
Oh, in, in the state. That was early. Was it a uh, silent movie? Howard Pulsper had a, gra a big garage. Where? <clears throat> Let's see if you want on the corner. Well, it's uh, by the... Block where the... <laughs> oh, what is the name of the place? Talmadges. It's a uh, parking lot now. Yeah. Part of the Golden West oh, that dragged okay. along there. So right you know where the Mike Burns is. Right. The, where the Elwood was. Uh huh. It just, it just but he in and that area. Uh, Howard Pulser and Elmer Hughes would bring in the show once a week. And we'd go in the garage and sit on just planks across and watch that show for 10 cents. They just if they have a big screen. He'd come anyway. <laughs> Sneak in. How did the old folks handle those? I mean, the old, you know, old folks in those days, you kids were kids. Uh, yeah, some of those old folks, I've heard stories about, for example, uh, uh, Mary Jane Abbott <laughs> getting so excited. <laughs> they, they had a continual uh, show, you know, and you had to go every week. Or you miss. So they had this about 30 minutes of this continued show. Serial. Serial. Uh -huh. uh, I used to love to sit close by Aunt Ed Woodbury. She was a, a place. Uh -huh. wife. She was quite, she had quite a loud voice. <laughs> and uh, she would read the words to uh, Brother Woodbury. And so that. That was before we could read it, before I could read it, or couldn't read fast enough to, uh, anyway, it was, it was a delight to sit by her and I just could go along with her, she'd get Who played the piano? I can't remember, I know the piano was played quite a bit. I mean, they always had music to go along with uh -huh. yeah. Maybe Emily Hughes, would she have done? I don't know if she was about that early. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you when you saw your first airplane in Mesquite? In Mesquite? Gosh, I was old. <laughs> over or flying over? Flying over, yeah. We, uh, oh, yeah, snow, snow. we all went to St. George to see one land up there. When was that? Do you remember the year? I was uh, just a kid. Uh -huh. And we waited all day and didn't ever come. <laughs> it was going to land down in the Washington fields. Yeah. And we waited all day and no airplane. Oh, I think it came in the next day. <laughs> Nobody was there to see him. <laughs> I, I read a Fenton Frainer went up to St. George to see an airplane. And he bought one. Just an old cloth airplane. Never had flown it before. The guy showed him how to start it and how to. And he flew it home and landed it on the mid <laughs> And that was a long time ago. Well, when was the first time you rode on an airplane? Was it propellers or jets? It was a jet. How about you? Oh, propeller. I was trying to think what year. Okay, now when you were young, you rode in old cars and horses and buggies, and you finally got in an airplane. What did you think? <laughs> I don't know. It was <clears throat> it was kind of something special, you know. And I can remember the first car I ever I ever had. We were <clears throat> it was on the Fourth of July in St. George, and uh, they were having they were taking. They had about five cars. And they'd take, uh, fill it with kids, take it down around the temple and back, and they empty it and fill it up again, and everybody got a car ride that day. <laughs> that was your first car ride? That was the first car ride. Well, a few of us in here can remember when television first came in the valley. Uh, when did you get a television in your home? I was in the 50s. <laughs> you, had, you had television before it came in the valley as, as far as over the, you know, when everybody started getting it. I know Fire Hughes and a few others had big long antennas that they could get some Vegas stations. 
a little bit, but it was just not satisfactory. It was just not. Snow. We can see things. It was just things moving in the snow. I remember going to, to use his daughter Hughes' house to watch television because he kept talking about wrestling. And so a bunch of us went from school and went down, and all I saw was black and white snow. <laughs> But for the benefit of those of you who are new, television, like they said, did come in the valley here in the 50s, early 50s. Basically, everyone, every person in the valley bought a share of the television company, so they could afford to put a translator up here on the mountain and get stations from Salt Lake City. Because Las Vegas wouldn't participate, but Salt Lake channels would. And uh, up by the recreation center, they put a great big tower in the air one night and had a generator there that they had it, all the men and people come up in parked in the field there to see television. And everybody forked over so much money so they'd bring it into town. And that's how we had TV for a long time. Everybody would pay so much a month on the water bill to pay for the television. Are those shares worth anything? I just ran across my in fact, uh, in fact, there's there's quite a few of those original shareholders yeah. who don't know that their their television station got stolen by somebody in St. George. <laughs> <laughs> now we're paying for it for cable and <laughs> because St. George gave it to him. Uh, electricity, when you first got that in your home, how did that make a difference in your life? Well, it made a big difference, I'll tell you. <laughs> we, uh, when we got electricity, we could get electric iron. We didn't have to heat our arms on the stove and iron, and we uh, could have a refrigerator. And, well, it was just, it was really a celebration when we got the power. <laughs> so, uh, how did you cool your food? How did you keep your food cool before you had refrigeration? Well, I had a, I had a little, made out of burlap, you know, the uh, little covered light. Covered? And uh, with a dripper on top. Water would drip down over it? Well, we'd have to uh, take the sides of it and put it up in the water and then down. We'd do that a dozen times a day. Would you have that in the house or outside? Outside, under the trees. Hey, so how was yours? Uh, I remember quite early uh, when they were making ice in Bunkerville at Ice Plant. Dad would buy a big chunk of that, and we had a uh, ice box. I ice guess box. You'd call it. Yeah. We'd put the ice in the top, and it was it yeah, worked, it was good. a lot better than uh, just not having it. The burlap, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I would imagine that just not having to use that wood stove to cook with, yeah. you know, yeah. with the power. Of, Electricity, the stove wouldn't be so hot, the house wouldn't be so hot. It'd be quite a bit nicer. Oh, yes, I should say. Yeah, it sure got hot washing dishes over. Or that hot stove? Uh huh. Got the big dish pan there for washing dishes to keep the water hot. Especially in July and August. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, as you're going to high school, what sports were being played? Oh, we played baseball. And I don't, I don't think they ever played football, did they? I, that was a little later, I think it was even after my, after I... Basketball, football? Basketball, football, baseball. track. I mean baseball, yeah. yeah. Track, field. Oh yeah, track was fun, we could get out and... Did they have girls teams back then? Uh, yeah. Some, but the boys got more of the attention. The girls kind of come along behind. I yeah, know, we, we competed quite a bit. I know the high school girls in 1960 took Nevada State title. Mm -hmm. That's some years later. Yeah. Uh, so, what did you do for fun? You went to school. <laughs> Why did you go to high school? School and play games at night, you know, out into the, after we had electricity, we had uh, light, uh, light poles. Uh -huh. And we'd go out there and play games at night till. We didn't want to get up in the morning. <laughs> well, why did you go to high school? Bunkerville. In Bunkerville? And how did you go over? In the school bus. 
Uh, we have a picture of the school bus. We have a picture here. of the school bus here. It's not like we remember school no. bus. Uh, Very pretty. Oh, Suzanne, can you reach that up and show them that? Yeah. Geraldine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an old, uh, looks like an old Model A. <laughs> well, it was, it was made. I mean, did they just build it from... Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. It was in on it, you know, to Howard. Homemade school it bus. Was, it was really yeah. something else. But it'd be walking most of the time, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, people were pleased at the time. I mean, it was, you know, improvement. Uh, so when you went to the dances, how, how did you have music? There wasn't any phonographs or radios. Oh, yeah. the you, had that oh, right. <laughs> you had a what? Dutch and Ethel. Dutch and Ethel on the piano, saxophone. She played the piano, and she played the, what was it? Saxophone. Saxophone, uh-huh. And can you remember any others? Music, Hazel, for dances? Uh, well, I can remember the Gerard Bowler and his wife. Yes. That was quite early. I was pretty small, though. Uh, I, what did I, they play? Was that piano and the fiddle? The piano or? and the fiddle, I guess. And it seemed like there was uh, someone else. Well, there was some, sometimes someone that, that beat the drum. Beat the drum? Yeah. <laughs> well, it sounded like music to us. I mean, we did <laughs> <laughs> So did you go to a, you know, when, when we were in high school, you'd get a girlfriend or a boyfriend, you'd go to the dance, you'd dance all night, and, you know. Uh, did you have dates back then to go to the dances, or did you just sure. meet the dance? <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's the most fun. Uh, uh, you didn't have to have a date. The, the women all sat on one side and the men on the other. And then when the music would start, the men would walk over and get their partner. And when it was through, the women would go back to one side and the men the other. <laughs> so if you wanted to dance with the same partner all night long, could you? No. How come? Because uh, unless he beat somebody else to you. Things <laughs> <laughs> to change a little bit when I come along. <laughs> Did they still have uh, the dance, uh, what do you call them, the dance floor? Marshals. <laughs> yes. Oh, I think. That would not let you dance very close, or if you acted up, they'd kick you out. Uh, so. You have to be careful. <laughs> so, what kind of dances did you do? I mean, was it you, you didn't dance like they do today? So, what kind of no, dances? it was. Uh, we called it the box trot and the waltz and <laughs> whatever the music. But the jitterbug. I mean, uh, Charleston. Those things come along yet? They had. Not, not very. I can remember when they started to do the Charleston. Did that shock people? Oh, they didn't do it much around here. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Hazel? You're younger. You're uh, one of those young chicks. Did you I do the Charleston? <laughs> we tried to do it, but uh, I don't think it was that popular around. I don't remember the, the dances. <laughs> Did you dress the way they show those? People dressing and dances and all that. Uh, I think the well, not quite quite that much, but the, the styles were different. It's long waisted and <laughs> belts down low. And, uh, so, if you wanted to get good dresses and things that way, did you go to Jimmy Use a store and get them, or <laughs> make your own, or go to St. George or Sears Roebuck? Oh, yeah, Sears Roebuck was really popular. I don't think there was any. <clears throat> Bottom dress at that time. Everybody made their own. Okay, you go to the dance and you get yourself a boyfriend. And you fall in love and you decide you want to get married. How did the weddings go? I mean, did they have weddings to, you know, like they do today? You go sit down, eat a cookie, and leave? What were the weddings like no, out there? Was, the receptions. They always had a. They always had a, a line, you know, for and pass things around, and, and uh, you, you gave your you gave your present, and it was it was all put together, you know, and, and uh, but everybody danced. Was there big crowds? Oh yes, everybody danced then. 
So the whole town would come out to work. Uh -huh. The whole valley may come to work. Yes, if, if you had a baby, you brought a blanket to lay it on and left it out in the hall. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever do that, Hazel? Uh, I used to go to the weddings, but I, of the receptions, but I didn't, didn't have a big reception when I was married. I don't know really why. I don't think Don wanted one. He didn't go for too much of that, <laughs> that kind of stuff. But we had parties. We, we celebrated our wedding. Where did you get wedding. your wedding dress? What's that? Where did you get your wedding dress? Uh, do you believe I got it St. George? It had to be remodeled. It was just like a, <laughs> like we made it, but it, it started out being a, a store dress. And then we, how about you, Margaret? Did you buy your dress or make your dress? I bought it. Somebody come through selling dresses. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I bought this dress and I use it for a wedding dress. What? Well, you know, we'd have people come through selling things like that all the time. Dresses and dresses and, and anything that, anything that the Rollins man and the Watkins man and all of those. We used to look forward to them coming sometime and they bring a lot of goodies. I can remember a man coming and selling vacuum cleaners. And then my dad and my Uncle Merle chased him to the riverside to get the money back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're, I'm kind of interested in how the, the courting and dating traditions, what they were like when you were dating and courting. How, how did you go about that? I mean. Today, they, they go outside and they honk the horn and somebody runs, you know. No, it's different. They didn't do it then. They, that is the way they did it. Okay, so you decide you like a boy. How do you get together with that boy to, to go on a date or an activity? Well, you just hope that he liked you. And <laughs> <laughs> then, then you're going to Pardon me? Then he'll come and pick you up. <laughs> he uh, likes you. Uh, did he have to ask your parents and things that way? I don't think so. I don't think Vaughn asked my mother. <laughs> she would have said no. <laughs> Can you remember any uh, epidemics hitting in your lifetime here in Mesquite? You know, flu epidemics? Yeah. Or mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? Yes. For the year? <clears throat> You know, like measles, and it gets started. And everybody, you know, if you were exposed to it, you get it. We had no vaccinations or anything like that. But uh, lots of lots of epidemics, and the whole family. I know I didn't have mumps till till one of my kids had them. And then I'll tell you, I had the most. <laughs> we don't even hear about things like that anymore. Did they ever get to a time that you can remember that they just shut the town down? No church, no school? And they did at one time when the flu first, you know, when they, the first day of epidemic of flu. Back in 1918, uh, 19 through there? Right after World War I? Uh-huh. It'll be about in 1919. I think there was five men, five people, five or six people died in the valley of that flu. Yeah, that was... How about you, Hazel? Can you ever remember church and things being closed down because of sickness? I don't remember that too much. I'm just thinking about my family all having the whooping cough together. Yeah. We, we had a very good time. <laughs> <laughs> Who doctored you when you got sick like uh, that? I don't know of having a doctor, but the mother, they would keep in touch with the doctor that we had the telephone then, and they would kind of help us out, send stuff down on the mail or... Medicine. But I think we just kind of weathered through a lot of... Did you have the homemade remedies lived and the others died. <laughs> Did you have homemade remedies in your home for... Uh, I guess so. I don't remember too much. Margaret, can you remember homemade remedies? Yes. What were they? Well, it seemed like uh, 
every summer, you know, we'd go all summer without without uh, meat. And then in the fall, we'd get the kids would get uh, sores. We called them desert sores. But uh, we'd make we'd put uh, a sulfur in the water, mix it, you know, together, and then rub it on. <laughs> it was a mess. <laughs> But that's what we used. Sulfur and Lord. Sulfur and Lord. Uh -huh. I, I, I remember there's a lot of homemade remedies that different ones would use. I just wondered if you had a favorite one in your home. When Charlie got sick, what did you do with Charlie? He was a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, reading and hearing stories, Margaret, of... Uh, and I don't know the year, but there was a group of ladies here in Mesquite, and you were kind of in charge of it, that started a uh, literary club. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, it was, uh, Bertha Howe was uh, the nurse here, and the, uh, where the old, the museum is now was, was the hospital. And uh, we all got together and, and started this, literary club, we'd, uh, somebody would uh, give a book report, you know, each week, uh -huh. and uh, it was it was really nice. About how many people would come to that? And there was about, oh, at least 12, or I think at one time we had about 20. Was there very much, you know, I mean, this is kind of a rough little old Pioneer town here, but cultures of the East, that kind of thing that would go on here as far as literary clubs or well, the, social groups. <clears throat> the lady that started it was, you know, was an Easterner. <laughs> she was, she was uh, married to Chris Jensen. Does any of you remember him? I do. <laughs> okay, and she she was an educated lady. She's the one that's this uh, If you can remember, how were community, you, you know, you had a decision was made to, we're going to gravel the roads or we're going to put street lights up or we're going to, who made those decisions in the, in the town? How were those decisions made? Was there a city government, a town government, or was it through the bishoprics or? Yes, town board. Yeah, they called it. Town board? Uh -huh, I don't know how many, three or four. My dad was on, was chairman of it for years. It seemed like during the 30s and 40s. Did they get much help from the county on anything they wanted? Uh, not an awful lot, but they did help us. Some. Las Vegas needed a lot of stuff too, so they kind of, uh, I remember dad used to kind of work some of the politicians up north and we got you know, Actually, you did better by going up north than uh -huh. getting it from the state. That yeah, he, did, he knew quite a few of them. Dad did, he, right. on purpose. So, who, who took care of enforcing the rules in town? Did you have a sheriff when you were kids? Yeah, we had. We always had a sheriff. <laughs> who was the sheriff when you were a kid? Uh, Rick Hardy. Who? Rick? Rick Hardy. Was he tough? He thought he was. <laughs> he what? He thought he was. <laughs> Did he carry a gun? Um, I don't think so. So it wasn't like the old west? No. <laughs> but if somebody had a problem, if somebody said that somebody took my horse or somebody did something wrong, would they go to Brig or would they go to the bishop? Or? I was going to say they depended on the bishop for a <laughs> So let's say you wanted to build a community, a school. They built a school up here where the old community center is now in Mesquite. How did they make sure that building was safe? You know, today we have all these city they didn't have any. inspectors and all how did they do that then? Uh, well, it would be according to who was building if the school. They would have people coming out of, out of Las Vegas. 
supervise. Oh, see, the no. church. Excuse me. Go ahead. Uh, the church and the school, you know, work together. That's the only, the only meeting house we had was a schoolhouse. And the first schoolhouses was built by the people, you know, yes. right here, not not Las Vegas. Yeah. They just kind of just did good work because they were going to be going to church and didn't really have inspectors or anything. No, we didn't have an ins inspector. Okay. How often do you think the contact with the county or the city, I mean the county or the state, as far as government officials coming into town and helping out or visiting or something that way? I don't know how much they come into town, but my dad used to make a lot of trips to Vegas to contact It was shorter from here to Vegas than it was from Vegas. Back. It seemed like it. Uh, so if there was a problem, let's say a flood come down and tore out a bunch of stuff like it just happened now, a natural disaster or a fire or something like that, how did you fix it as a town? The people just went in and helped. Just got in and they did just it. got in and did it. Aren't you glad you didn't have the environmentalists to keep you going? <laughs> that would be tough to have. <clears throat> have to put up with them too. <laughs> Can you tell your memories of the atomic bomb? When they first started testing atomic bombs? Tell us about it. We used to get up early and go up on Lynch Hill. Where the high school is. Where the high school is. And watch it. And you'd see this big light, you know, come up. And it was clear. That's how it would have been from here, 80 miles. 90 or so, yeah. Was... So we'd stand out there and watch it. Get up where we could see it, you know, when we knew it was going on. Did it ever do any damage here in town that you know of? Not that I know of. They came out at a time or two and kind of warned us that uh, after it had happened, yeah. that maybe maybe we should go inside or something. I don't know. But uh, I know it was a long time. No, but but they, the, the, the noise, excuse me, the concussion, the bomb itself didn't cause any windows breaking or anything this way. That you know. It was exciting watching it. It was really a fantastic sight. <laughs> and Mushroom cloud. Mm -hmm. Never seen those. How often did they do those? Can you remember? Quite often, didn't they? No. We watched a lot of them, but I don't. Uh, yeah. I yeah. The, I there never was a big deal by the government. There was any danger? It was uh -huh. just you know. No, we didn't. Uh, I don't know if Suzanne can remember, but I remember by the time morning recess come up at the elementary school here, the, the mushroom cloud would be going over uh -huh. and it'd be so dusty and pink uh -huh. that you could, couldn't see across okay. the playground. And sometimes they notify us and say, the cloud is coming your way, close the schools and send everyone home. The minute they closed the schools, where were we? Tell what it was like during World War One, Two, the Korean War. Did we have a lot of men leave this valley to go to those? Oh yes, it, just about all the men left. There wasn't very many left at home. How did you feel that? Well, we'd go and dance, and, and girls would dance with girls <laughs> because there was no boys. What about the chores and the fields and things and the keeping the ditches clean? Was there enough men to do that? Mm -hmm. I think that so. They seemed to do it. Uh -huh. And then when they cleaned the ditch, you know, they have to, had to clean the ditch once a year. Yeah. And they'd let them out so that the, the boys could go help. The young boys could help. Yeah. And I, there's there's about 125 men left this valley for World War II. And I think there was like a total of 600 population from Littlefield to Riverside. And when you figure that 125 men went to war, uh, you know, that's a 
that's a pretty high percentage by the time you take the women and the kids out. There's not many men left in this rally. Uh, I'm going to give you a minute to think about this. Uh, name three things about mesquite you wish had never changed. You can start with just one. One thing you wish had never changed in mesquite. I don't know whether I want to say. <laughs> the population. You wish it hadn't got so big? Yes. Okay. What else? Anything else?
Or when you first had an automobile, how long would it take? It took two days. Two days? In, in my dad's book telling about them when he and mother were married in 1910, that it took them, Grandma Johnson went with them as chaperone, took them two uh, days to go. Where did they stay over? Castle Cliffs? Oh, anyway. <laughs> they would, they would camp along the way. Um, I guess. I, the road they, went up the river uh, basically to Beaver Dam. And then it went up over the slope, and just up past Castle Cliff, a couple of a couple of miles, there was a place called Camp Streets, and that's where they would get about the first day in camp. And the same thing coming back. Uh, Benny. Yes. Morris Sylvester told me once that he had a good horse. He got up before daylight. You could get to St. George before it got midnight. Midnight. Is that going through the gorge or going up over the mountains? Going up over the mountains. Okay. There's got to be a horse. I mean, if you could go faster with the horse. I guess emergencies, they did do that a lot of times. I read where uh, your dad was in the High Council and assigned to Caliente yeah. and Panaca and would ride up leave Saturday and go up through Tule Bench and up through Carp and Elgin in Caliente, Panaca, back down through. Wouldn't get home till Wednesday night. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I was wondering, both these ladies were born here in this heat. What brought their families to this area? Why did they move here? Why did your families move in to Mesquite? Well, my father homesteaded a ranch in Arizona. You know, they got their school and, and everything. But the, the ranch that he homesteaded in Arizona was just right here by Lynch Hill, by the way, some golf course. Yeah. But why why did he come here? I mean, about all the places in the world, why did he come to ski? He said he was so tired of being cold all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know where was born. <laughs> he, he was How crazy. about yours, Hazel? Uh, my grandfather decided, Grandfather Pulsford decided that uh, he needed more property. That they were living up at Hebron, up by Enterprise, uh -huh. and he needed, needed more property. You know, he was a farmer, and uh, they kind of scouted around different places, and they thought that this looked pretty good here. Yeah. And where did they come and, here from? What? Where were you? Where were your families before you came to the ski? Uh, my parents. Uh, my father and his family came from uh, Gunlock, up in that area of uh, Hebron. Before that, where did they come from? Uh, it's a question about the post of first. Uh, uh, we, we can't, our genealogy, we're having a hard time with the post first. Now, the Johnsons, who were my mother's parents, we've been able to trace that. But they came because of Brigham Young. I mean, they right. came to Margaret, where were your family from before they came here? Your father, where did they live before they came they here? In Richfield. Richfield? Uh -huh. So basically they were in this area because of the church, moving yeah. here to be with the church and then just came he to get warm. He said he got so tired of being cold all the time that he wanted to come here where he could be Keep warm. It's, it's warm. <laughs> you get enough warm to last all winter. Any other questions? Yes. I read that some of the uh, children and then going to school when it was really hot, taking the wagons up towards White Rock. And I wonder if they went there and what kind of facilities were up there at that time. Uh, taking wagons up to White Rock for school trips or picnics or yes. community. When it was hot. And, and, uh, what was it like? The whole town would go at times. Pardon me? The whole town would go, you know, everybody would go up there. And what was there? A, a spring water. The water, that was good water, and it was cooler. It, was there an orchard up in that area there, too? Uh, Did uh, Henry? Uh, Henry uh, Levitt had an orchard up there. 
But as far as facilities for camping, you just took your wagon up and took the wagon and slept on the ground. It'd be very near what they were living here. So. <laughs> yeah, same thing. <laughs> The, the facilities that are up there now were done in the early 60s by uh, uh, Webb. What was his name? Leon, Leon. Leon Webb, yeah. Uh, a church group. And we all went up there and cemented the tables and everything. And the two towns were going to have a park up there, but the county made a stop because they said liability was such that they didn't want to be responsible. So now it's just a mess. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Fill it up again, and everybody got a car ride that day. <laughs> That's your first car ride. That was the first car ride. Well, a few of us in here can remember when television first came in the valley. Uh, when did you get a television in your home? I don't know. It was in the fifties. I did we? You had, did you have television before it came in the valley as, as far as over the, you know, when everybody started getting it? I know Claire Hughes and a few others had big long antennas that they could get some Vegas stations. A little bit, but it was just not satisfactory. It was just kind of... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember going uh -huh. yeah. to, to Hughes's, Donnie Hughes's house to watch television because he kept talking about wrestling. Mm -hmm. And so a bunch of us went from school and went down and all I saw was black and white snow. Uh -huh, <laughs> <laughs> but for the benefit of those of you who are new, television, like they said, did come in the valley here in the 50s, early 50s. Basically, everyone, every person in the valley bought a share of the television company so that they could afford to put a translator up here on the mountain and get stations from Salt Lake City because Las Vegas wouldn't participate, but Salt Lake channels would. And uh, up by the recreation center, they put a great big tower in the air one night and had a generator there that they had a, all the men and people come up on, in, parked in the field there to see television and everybody forked over so much money so they'd bring it into town. and. That's how we had TV for a long time. Everybody would pay so much a month on their water bill to pay for the television. Are those shares worth anything? I just ran no. across <laughs> mine the other day. <laughs> <laughs> I, in, fact, uh, in fact, there's there's quite a few of those original shareholders yeah. <laughs> who don't know that their, their television station got stolen by somebody in St. George. <laughs> now we're paying for it for cable and... <laughs> <laughs> because St. George gave it to him. Uh, electricity, when you first got that in your home, how did that make a difference in your life? Well, it made a big difference, I'll tell you. <laughs> we, uh, When we got electricity, we could get electric iron. We didn't have to heat our irons on the stove and iron, and we uh, could have a refrigerator. And, well, it was just, it was really... A celebration when we got the power. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> how did you cool your food? How do you keep your food cool before you had refrigeration? Well, I had a, I had a little made out of burlap, you know, the uh, little cupboard like cupboard, mm -hmm. and uh, with a dripper on top. Water would drip down over. Well, we'd have to uh, take the sides of it and put up in the water and then down. We do that a dozen times a day. Would you have that in the house or outside? Outside, under the trees. Hazel, how was yours? Uh, I remember quite early uh, when they were making ice in Bunkerville, that ice plant. Dad would buy a big chunk of that, and if we had a re uh, ice box, I ice guess box. you'd call it. Uh -huh. We'd put the ice in the top, and it was, it yeah, worked, pretty it was good. a lot better than uh, just not having it. Than the burlap, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I would imagine that just not having to use that wood stove to cook with, yeah. you know, with the power, it, electricity, the stove wouldn't be so hot, the house wouldn't be so hot. It would be quite a bit nicer. Oh, yes, I should say. Yeah, it, <coughs> it sure got hot washing dishes over. Over that hot stove? Uh-huh. Have the big dish pan there washing dishes to keep the water hot. And Especially in July and August. Yeah. <laughs> 
so as you're going to high school, what sports were being played? Oh, they played baseball, and I don't, I don't think they ever played football, did they? I don't. But that was a little later. I think it's uh -huh. even after my, after I. Basketball, football. Basketball, football, baseball. Track. I mean baseball, yeah. Yeah. Track, field. Oh yeah, track was fun. We could get out and. Did they have girls teams the back then? Uh. Yeah. Some, but. The boys got more of the <laughs> attention. The girls kind of come along behind. I yeah, we did, we competed quite a bit. And I know the high school girls in 1916 took Nevada State title. Mm -hmm. That was some years later. Yeah. Uh, so what did you do for fun? You went to school. <laughs> Why did you go to high school? School and played games at night. You know, out into the after we had electricity, we had. Uh, la uh, light poles, uh -huh. and we'd go out there and play games at night till we didn't want to get up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, wh where did you go to high school? Bunkerville. In Bunkerville, mm -hmm. and how did you go over? In the school bus. We have a picture yeah. of the school bus. We have a bus picture here. of the school bus here. It's not like we remember a school no. bus. Uh, very crude. I don't know, Suzanne. Can you reach that up and show them there, For Geraldine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an old, uh, looks like an old Model A. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. He was in on it, he and Uncle Howard. Homemade school it bus. Was, it was really something else. But it beat walking most of the time, oh, yeah. didn't it? Yeah, people were pleased at the time. I mean, it was, you know, improvement. Uh, so when you went to the dances, how, how did you have music? There wasn't any... Phonographs oh, and radios. Had, we the had Dutch and Ethel. <laughs> you had a what? Dutch and Ethel. Dutch and Ethel on they the piano our, and saxophone. They were always our music. She played the piano and he played the, what was it? Saxophone. Saxophone, uh-huh. And can you remember any others? Music, Hazel, for dances? Uh, well, I could remember after George Bowler and to his wife. Yes. Uh, that was quite early. I was pretty small, though. Uh -huh. I did. What did they play? Was that piano and the uh, fiddle? Piano or? and the fiddle, I guess. And it seemed like there was uh -huh. someone else. Well, there was uh, sometimes someone that, that beat the drum. Beat a drum? Yeah. <laughs> well, it sounded like music to us. I mean, we <laughs> thought it was. <laughs> so did you go to a, you know, when when... We were in high school, you'd get a girlfriend or a boyfriend, you'd go to the dance, and you'd dance all night, and, you know, uh, did you have dates back then to go to dances, or did you Ooh, just sure. meet at the dance? Sure. <laughs> that was the most fun. Uh, uh, you didn't have to have a date. The, the women all sat on one side and the men on the other, and then when the music would start, the men would walk over and get their partner. Uh -huh. and then when it was through, they'd, women would go back to one side and the men the other. <laughs> so if you wanted to dance with the same partner all night long, could you? No. How come? Because uh, unless he beat somebody else to you. <laughs> <laughs> Things had changed a little bit when I'd come along. <laughs> Did they still have uh, the dance, uh, what do you call them, the dance floor? Marshals, <laughs> yes. Oh, I think that would not let you dance very close, or if you acted up, they'd kick you out and that kind of stuff. <laughs> you had to be careful. <laughs> so, what kind of dances did you do? I mean, was it you, you didn't dance like they do today? So, what kind of no, dances? No, it was uh, we called it the foxtrot and the waltz and <laughs> whatever the music. But the jitterbug, I mean, the Charleston and those things come along yet? They had. Not, not very. I can remember when they started to do the Charleston. Did that shock people? Oh, they didn't do it much around here. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Hazel? You're younger. You're uh, one of those young chicks. Did you I do the Charleston? <laughs> <laughs> we tried to do it, but uh, I don't think it was that popular around. I don't remember the, uh, the dances. And did you dress the way they show those? People dressing at dances, you know. Uh, I think the well, not quite. Qu 
quite that much, but the, the styles were different. The, the long waisted and <laughs> belts down low. And uh -huh. So, if you wanted to get good dresses and things that way, did you go to Jimmy Hughes' store and get them, or make your own, or go to St. George or Sears Roebuck? Make your own. Oh, yeah, Sears Roebuck was really popular. Then. I don't think there was many <coughs> bought and dresses at that time. Everybody made their own. Okay, you go to the dance and you get yourself a boyfriend, and you fall in love and you decide you want to get married. <laughs> How did the weddings go? I mean, did they have weddings to, you know, like they do today? You go sit down, eat a cookie, and leave. <laughs> what were the weddings like no, back then? No, that was the a, receptions. They always had a, they always had a, a line, you know, for and pass things around, and and uh, if you gave your, you gave your present, and it was it was all put together, you know, and, and uh, but everybody danced. Was there big crowds? Oh, yes. Everybody danced then. So the whole town would come out to a everybody, wedding. Uh -huh. The whole valley may come to a yes, wedding. Yes, if you had a baby, you brought a b uh, blanket to lay it on and <laughs> left it out in the hall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did you ever do that, Hazel? Uh, I used to go to the weddings, but I, of the receptions, but I didn't didn't have a big reception when I was married. I don't know really why. I don't think Don wanted one. He didn't uh -huh. go for too much of that <laughs> that kind of stuff. But we had parties. We we why celebrated did, our wedding. Why did you get wedding. your wedding dress? What was that? Why did you get your wedding dress? Uh, gee, I believe I got it in St. George. It had to be remodeled. It was just like a. <laughs> Like we'd made it, but uh, it it started out being a, uh -huh. a store dress, and then we. How about you, Margaret? Did you buy your dress or make your dress? I bought it. Somebody come through selling dresses, <laughs> 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 and I, and I bought this dress, and I use it for a wedding dress. Well, you know, we'd have people come through selling things like that all the time. Dresses and dresses pots and, and anything and that, mm -hmm. anything that the Raleigh's man and the Watkins man and all of those. We used to look forward to them coming sometime. They'd bring a lot of goodies. I can remember a man coming and selling vacuum cleaners, and then my dad and Monk, Uncle Merle chased him clear to Riverside to get their money back. <laughs> uh, so we're. I'm kind of interested in how the the courting and dating traditions, what they were like when you were dating and courting. Uh, how how did you go about that? I mean, today they they go outside and they honk the horn and somebody <laughs> runs, you know. No, it's a little different. They didn't do it then. They, that isn't the way they did it. Okay, so you decide you like a boy. How do you get together with that boy to, to go on a date or an activity? Well, you just hope that he liked you and did you. <laughs> Then, then he'll know, come and pick you up. Pardon me? Then he'll come and pick you up. Mm -hmm. uh, he likes you. Uh, <laughs> did he have to ask your parents and things that way? I don't think so. I don't think mine asked my mother. <laughs> <laughs> she would have said no. <laughs> <laughs> Can you remember any uh, epidemics? hitting in your lifetime here in Mesquite, you know, flu epidemics. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? Yes. And or the year? Or <coughs> and, the, you know, like measles, and it gets started and everybody, you know, if you were exposed to it, you'd get it. We had no vaccinations or anything like that. But uh, lots of, lots of epidemics. And the whole family, I know I didn't have mumps till, till one of my kids had them, and then I'll tell you, <laughs> I had the mumps. <laughs> we don't even hear about things like that anymore. Did they ever get to a time that you can remember that they just basically shut the town down, no church, no school? They did at one time when the flu 
first, you know, when they, the first epidemic of flu. Back in 19, um, 18, 19 through there? Right after World War I? Uh-huh. It would be about in 1919. Yeah, I think there was five men, five people, five or six people died in the valley of that flu. Yeah, that was... How about you, Hazel? Can you ever remember church and things being closed down because of sickness? I don't remember that, Tim. I'm just thinking about my family all having the whooping cough together. Oh, yeah? We, we had a very good time. <laughs> <laughs> Who doctored you when you got sick like uh, that? I don't know of having a doctor, but uh, Mother, they would keep in touch with the doctor that we had the telephone then and they would kind of help us out send stuff down on the mail or medicine but I think we just kind of weathered through a lot of uh, did you have <laughs> the homemade sturdy remedies lived in your and home? the others died <laughs> <laughs> did you have homemade remedies in your home for uh, I guess so I don't remember too much Margaret can you remember homemade remedies yes what were they well it seemed like uh, Every summer, you know, we'd go all summer without without uh, meat, and then in the fall we'd get the kids would get uh, sores. We called them desert sores. But uh, we'd make we'd put uh, a sulfur and lard, mix it, you know, together, and then rub it on them. <laughs> it was a mess. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we used. Sulfur and, and, and lard. Sulfur and lard. I, 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 I remember there's a lot of homemade remedies that different ones would use. And I just wondered if you had a favorite one in your home. When Charlie got sick, what did you do with Charlie? To the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, reading and hearing stories, Margaret, of, uh, and I don't know the year, but there was a group of ladies here in Mesquite, and you were kind of in charge of it, that started a uh, literary club. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, it was uh, Bertha Howe was uh, the nurse here, and li uh, where the old m the museum is now was was the hospital, and uh, we all got together and and started this literary club. We'd Somebody would uh, give a book report, you know, each week, uh -huh. and uh, it was it was really nice. About how many people would come to that? And there was about oh, at least twelve, or I think at one time we had about twenty. Was there very much, you know? I mean, this is kind of a rough little old pioneer town here, but cultures of the East, that kind of thing that would go on here as far as literary clubs or well, the social <coughs> groups? The lady that started it was, you know, was an Easterner. <laughs> she was, she was uh, married to Chris Jensen. If any of you remember him. I do. <laughs> okay. And she, she was a well-educated lady. And she's the one that's, that started it. Uh, if you can remember, how were communities, you, you know, you had a decision was made to, we're going to gravel the roads or we're going to put street lights up or we're going to, who made those decisions in the, in the town? How were those decisions made? Was there a city government, a town government, or was it mm -hmm. through the bishoprics or? They had a town board. Yeah, they called did. it. Town board? Uh-huh, I don't know how many, three or four. My dad was on, he was chairman of it for years, it seemed like during the 30s and 40s. Did they get much so, help from the county on anything they wanted? Uh, not an awfully lot, but they did help them some. Las Vegas needed a lot of stuff too, so they can. Uh, I remember dad used to kind of work some of the politicians up north and we got you know, some Actually, help. did better by going up north than uh -huh. getting it from the state. Than yeah, you he, did down. he knew quite a few of them. Dad did. He right. on purpose. So, who, who took care of enforcing the rules in town? 
Did you have a sheriff when you were kids? Yeah, we had a. Yeah. We always had a sheriff. <laughs> Who was the sheriff when you were a kid? Um, Brig Hardy. Who? Brig? Brig Hardy. Was he tough? <laughs> he thought he was. <laughs> he what? He thought he was. <laughs> <laughs> Did he carry a gun? Um, I don't believe so. So it wasn't like the old west? No. <laughs> but if somebody had a problem, if somebody said that somebody took my horse or somebody did something wrong, would they go to Brig or would uh -huh. they go to the bishop? Or? I was going to say they depended on the bishop for a lot of it. <laughs> so uh, let's say you wanted to build a community building, a school. They built a school up here where the old community center is now in Mesquite. How did they make sure that building was safe? You know, today we have all these city... They didn't have any... Inspectors and all that. So how did they do that back then? Uh -uh. Well, it'd be according to who was building. If the school, they would have people a superintendent coming out of, out of Las Vegas to supervise. Well, see, the no, church... Excuse me. Go ahead. Uh, the church and the school, you know, worked together. That's the only, the only meeting house we had was the schoolhouse. And the first schoolhouses was built by the people, you yes. know, right here, not not Las Vegas. Yeah. So they just kind of just did good work because they were going to be going to church in it. Didn't really have inspectors or anything. No, we didn't have an ins inspector. Okay. How often do you think there was any contact with the county or the city? I mean, the county or the state, as far as government officials coming into town and helping out or visiting or something that way? I don't know how I much they come into town, but my dad used to make a lot of trips to Vegas to contact them. Uh -huh. It always was shorter from here to Vegas than it uh -huh. was from Vegas back. It seemed like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if there was a problem, let's say a flood come down and tore out a bunch of stuff like it just happened now, a natural disaster or a fire or something like that, how did you fix it as a town? The, the people just went ahead and helped. Just got in and they did it. Just got in and did it. Aren't you glad you didn't have the environmentalists to keep you going? Uh, I say. <laughs> <laughs> that would be tough to have, <clears throat> have to put up with them too. <laughs> Can you tell uh, your memories of the atomic bomb when they first started testing atomic bombs? <laughs> Tell us you know, about we, it. We used to get up early and go up on Lynch Hill. <laughs> where the high school where, is. Where the high school is. And watch it. And you'd see this big light, you know, come up. And it was clear. Must how far would it have been from here? 80 miles? 90 or so, yeah. By but we'd stand out there and watch it. Get up where we could see it, you know, when we knew it was going off. Did it ever do any damage here in town that you know of? Not that I know of. They came out right. a time or two and kind of warned us that uh, after it had happened, yeah. that maybe maybe we should run inside or something. I don't know. But uh, I well, know it was a long time. No, but the, but the, the, the noise, excuse me, the concussion, the bomb itself didn't cause any windows think. breaking or anything this way that no. you know? It was exciting watching it. It was really a fantastic sight. <laughs> and the mushroom cloud, mm -hmm. remember seeing those? How often did they do those? Can you remember? Well, quite often, didn't they? I don't know. Do you guys? Know? <laughs> we watched a lot of them, but uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, the, uh, I there never was a big deal by the government that there was any danger. It uh -oh. was just, you know. No. Nope, we didn't. Uh, I don't know if Suzanne can remember, but I can remember th by the time morning recess come up at the elementary school here, the, the mushroom cloud would be going over, uh -huh. and it'd be so dusty and pink uh -huh. that you could, couldn't see across yeah. the playground. And sometimes they would notify us and say, the cloud is coming your way, close the schools and send everyone home. The they closed the schools, where were we? Out rolling around? <laughs> <the street? laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. ever remember going home. They must have kept me there. <laughs> 
during the can you tell what it was like during World War One and Two and the Korean War? Did we have a lot of men leave this valley to go to those wars? Oh yes, it. Just about all the men left. There wasn't very many left at home. How did you handle that? Well, we'd go to a dance and and girls would dance with girls <laughs> <laughs> because there was no boys. What about the chores in the fields and things and the keeping the ditches clean? Was there enough men to do that? Mm, I think that, so. They seemed to do it. Uh -huh. And then when they cleaned the ditch, you know, they have to, had to clean the water ditch once a year. Yeah. And they'd let school out so that the, the boys could go help. The young boys could help. Yeah. And... I, there's over, there's about 125 men left this valley for World War II. <laughs> and I think there was like a total of 600 population from Littlefield to Riverside. And when you figure that 125 men went to war, uh, you know, that's a pretty high percentage by the time you take the women and the kids out. There's not many men left in this valley. Uh, I'm going to give you a minute to think about this. Uh, name three things about mesquite you wish had never changed. You can start with just one. One thing you wished had never changed in mesquite. A smile, Hazel. <laughs> I don't know whether I want to say. <laughs> the population. <laughs> you wish it hadn't got so big? In a way, yes. Okay. What else? Anything else? Margaret, you had something. <laughs> I don't know. It, um, it seemed like we, we were all so close at that time. If something happened, it was just like a telegraph. Everybody knew it. Everyone, Everybody. everyone was there and helped. Uh -huh. They were there to help. Yeah, the closeness, I think. Closeness. But it's still a great town. I'm not... Yeah, saying anything. Name very three things then that you're very glad has changed. Our beautiful cemetery. It used <laughs> I to be that just, the other day just and weeds. I just <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything else that you would think is really oh. nice that you're glad that's here now? That wasn't when you were young? Stores, the, the, the convenience. You know, we everybody knew what everybody else was doing, <laughs> and you know we did help. Sometimes we criticized, but but most generally we helped. And and that's something that you miss. I I I remember that uh, when I was first married, still uh, back in the nineteen. 60s, early 60s. It was still a volunteer fire department. If there was a fire, the whole town showed up. <laughs> if there was a fire in Bunkerville, there would be a string of cars from Mesquite that went, <laughs> you'd think church had just let out. <laughs> and everybody over there to help. And the same thing over here. And I remember when the county got involved then and said, oh, you can't go to the fire unless you are a fire department personnel. And so they started yelling at people if they went to help. Only the fire department goes, so now nobody even cares. They just <laughs> stand back and watch it. As a person of great wisdom from years of personal experience, what advice would you give to the residents of Mesquite today? Hey, Margaret, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I don't know. I think we 
we still have the closeness, you know, with the, the original people that lived here. You know, we always, we always notice, notice if they've done something and uh -huh. it's in the paper. We're always aware of it. Can you think of any advice you'd give your children or grandchildren about life in general? Well, I, I say do the best you can. And, and uh, be yourself. <laughs> you, they know what's right, and we expect them to, to follow those rules. Hazel? I'm agreeing with everything she's <laughs> saying. I was well, trying to think what I could add. Uh, what? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I found a, a uh, record. A little, uh, uh, how do I want to say this? Small things that happen way back when causes big changes later on. You don't even realize it. Uh, I found a record of the Bunkerville Ward Bishopric meeting where John Lewis Pulsifer requested from the Bunkerville Ward Bishopric permission to come to church in Bunkerville instead of Mesquite. <laughs> the reason being it was closer to go across the river than it was to come all the way uptown through the sand. And so at that time, the boundary for the city of Mesquite basically went from the river right up Riverside Road to the Lincoln County line. Mm -hmm. And so the Pulse of a Ranch wasn't even legally in Mesquite. It was in Bunkerville, too. And the Bunkerville Ward denied that permission, said, no, you need to, you need to go to Mesquite. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that he was upset, but I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what change that would have brought had he gone to Bunkerville because he was such a driving force in the settling in, in the the growing of Mesquite and had he gone to Bunkerville what changes that would have made because it was John Lewis Pulsifer that made the decision basically of where the roads would go uh, the power lines the te uh, telephones is involved in all of this through the town board, the water systems, everything. Uh, it'd been interesting, that one little decision that was made back then, it'd been interesting to see if that would have changed anything. Do any of you have any questions you'd like to ask? Why don't you come up to the microphone so we can get it for the home audience. If you don't, I'll repeat it. <laughs> days. If you want to go to St. George before the automobiles, or when you first had an automobile, how long would it take? It took two days. Uh -huh. Two days? If in, you had good luck. In my dad's book telling about them when he and mother were married in 1910, that it took them, Grandma Johnson went with them as chaperone, took them two uh, days to go. Mm -hmm. Where did they stay over? Oh, anybody. <laughs> They would, uh, they would camp know. along the way. Uh, I guess. I the road went up the river uh, basically to Beaver Dam, and then it went up over the slope, and just up past Castle Cliff a couple of, couple of miles, there's a place called Camp Springs, and that's where they would get about the first day in camp. And same thing coming back. Uh, Yes. Midnight. <laughs> Is that going through the gorge or going up over the mountain? Okay. Of course, that would be a horse. I mean, if you could go faster with the horse, I guess. Emergencies, they did do that a lot of times. I read where uh, your dad was in the high council and assigned to Caliante yeah. and Panaca and would ride up, leave Saturday mm -hmm. and go up through Tule Bench and up through Carp and Elgin into Caliante, Panaca, 
back down through. Wouldn't get home till Wednesday night. <laughs> That's something. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Why did your families move into Mesquite? Well, my father okay. homesteaded a ranch in Arizona. But, you know, Just we kept them here for school yeah. and, and everything. But the, the ranch that you homesteaded in Arizona was just right here by the Lynch Hill, yes. by the Oasis uh -huh. Golf Course. Yeah. But why, why did he come here? I mean, of all, all the places in the world, why did he come to Mesquite? He said he was so tired of being cold all the time. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to go where it was warm. <laughs> he, he was How about he yours, came. Hazel? Uh, my grandfather decided, Grandfather Pulsford decided that uh, he needed more property than what they were living up at Hebron, up by Enterprise, uh -huh. and he needed, needed more property. You know, he was a farmer, and uh, they kind of scouted around different places, and they thought that this looked pretty good here. Where did and you what? My parents, uh, my father and his family came from uh, Gunlock up in that area, uh, Hebron. Before that, where did they come from? It's a question about the Pulsifers. Uh -huh. uh, we, we can't, our genealogy, we're having a hard time with the Pulsifers. Now, the Johnsons, who were my mother's parents, we've been able to trace that. <laughs> but they came because of Brigham Young. I mean, right. they came to St. George. And, and uh, was one of the first Margaret, uh, where were your family from before they came here? Your father, where did they live before they came lived here? lived in Richfield. Richfield? Uh-huh. So basically they were in this area because of the church, moving well, here to be with the church, and then just came to get warm. He said he got so tired of being cold all the time that he wanted to come where, where he could be, keep warm. It is it's warm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You can get enough warm to last all winter. Any other questions, Jess? I read that some of the uh, children and then going to school that was really hot came to the wagon that they were going to White Rock. And I wonder if they've been there and what kind of clothes were brought there at that time. Uh, taking wagons up to White Rock for school trips or picnics or yes. community. Yes, and, and uh, what was it the like? whole time would go at times. Pardon me? The whole town would go, you know, everybody would go up there and What was there? Um, a spring, water. The water, that and good water. And it was cooler. Did, was there an orchard up in that area there too? Uh, Didn't not, Henry? Uh, Henry uh, Levitt? Levitt had an orchard up there. But as far as facilities for camping, you just took your wagon up? Just took the wagon and... Slip on the, the ground. On the It'd ground be very near of what they were living here. So <laughs> yeah, same <laughs> thing. Uh -huh. it was <laughs> the, the facilities that are up there now were done in the early 60s by uh, uh, Webb. What was his name? Luana's. Leon Webb, yeah. Uh, a church group. And we all went up there and cemented the tables and everything. And the two towns are going to have a park up there but the county made a stop because they said liability was such that they didn't want to be responsible. So now it's just a mess. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. The inside of the Elward Theater. I can tell you well, that. You go ahead. It's just a show hall. <laughs> just a show hall. <laughs> did it, when you, when it first opened, did it have the seats? Or did you sit on? No, it, it had seats. We had it seats was. there. We would sit on the seats in the in Howard's garage when we watched the show. On shows. the planks. On planks. But I by know. the time the Elward Theater come along, they had seats and everything. Uh, yes. Man, that must have been great. It, it was. was. It was. It was. I remember they had a clock in there that's just like the one up here in Chalet that <laughs> told you the time. <laughs> and by the time we went. Suzanne and I, it was run by Mike Burns, 
and we couldn't start the show until Mike Burns yelled at everybody and told him shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but it was uh, it was a small room, probably like from the tape to the wall and just about that long, and and uh, wooden benches with arms. No bathroom, no restrooms. They had a little cubby hole that they sold pop and popcorn out of. Yes, Gary. Uh, he, he knew when you got old enough to pay the extra nickel. That's right. <laughs> but you know, Mike Burns gave me a pop once. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Been in water. Yeah. Yeah. Rolled. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Gary. I think it was alluded to earlier about the old movies, beginning movies, and somebody would uh, try to see somebody, you know, like a Western young fighter, see one guy sneaking around, and one person yell and tell the other guy to watch out. <laughs> Did you remember that from <laughs> Sister Woodbury and Sister Abbott? Oh, yes. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> Where they'd yell and tell them to watch out? In the movies, well, yeah, they they took it to heart. Everything, yeah, everything yeah, it was happened. a pretty serious business. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember seeing that a couple of times uh, in Bunkerville with Milo Adams. And it did. It was a lot of fun to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> I, Oscar was the sheriff and I remember the time that they came to Bunkerville mm. and Iron Tobler and Oscar and all of them, they, everybody that had new cars and they started at the bridge and would race to the entrance of Bunkerville on Christmas Day and the whole town <laughs> stand around the hills there as they went by <laughs> see who could win. But they oh. used to do that with horses. Racing was a big, oh, yeah. horse racing, things like that was a big event in the valley. I mean they, they celebrated that quite a bit. Well, the most exciting time was uh, on Christmas when um, they had a car and a horse race from Big, from big Band. Big Band is just yeah, yeah. right up here where the, the bridge is out on the old highway. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and that was really exciting. And the car had him all the way till the very end, and then the, the horse beat him. <laughs> the sand got the, got yeah. sand got the car. <laughs> And it was Ed Terry and, and Frank Burgess. <laughs> Frank had the car and, and uh, Ed Terry had the horse. And that was an exciting. We all were up in the wa in the lane there, you know, rooting for him and betting on him. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us about the uh, Peacock Flour Mill? Yes. Where was it? It was right at the the. Uh, old Mill. The first, uh huh, where the old mill. Old Mill Road. Yeah, on old Old Mill Road, but it was was uh, right there on the. They had How it close the, to Tuffy Ruth's canal. house. So you know, because of water running. It was in the area of Tuffy. I believe it was over a little further. A little east further towards sure. the up the ditch, further towards the golf course. It seems uh -huh. to me like it was up, but I'm not. Sure. Did you ever buy flour from there? Oh yeah. Oh gosh, yes. And it Brother was good Tobler. flour. Alfred Tobler wasn't he? Old? He was one of the millers, uh -huh. yeah. So, uh, how much would a sack of flour cost? A hundred pounds. Do you remember that? It cost about two and a half. Two and a half dollars. Uh huh. Was I was reading the late night's history, and she said that every girl in town had underwear. Yeah. With a blue peacock on it from the peacock <laughs> flour sacks. <laughs> <laughs> did you guys have peacock flower underwear? Oh yes. <laughs> did you? I didn't. It was, uh, it was good flower. We made dish towels with ours.
the old. That's the old. Called it the Abbott Hotel. Uh. Oh, okay. Across the other way. Yes. Yeah, that's the uh, the. Uh, the Abbott is it? Yeah, Abbott? William uh. Abbott. Uh huh. Ha home. Yeah, he. It was uh, called the Abbott Hotel at one time. Mm -hmm. And that's where you were home. born, Margaret. Uh huh. How come you was born there? Because she was midwife or something, or? Uh, yeah, she took care of mother. We lived on the ranch three miles up the river, but but she come down there and. To have. So when people had babies back in those days, how did you do that? You didn't go to the doctor. It took too long. No, we just had a midwife. And what would the midwife do? Deliver the baby. <laughs> and then did she go home, or did she stay around and help a while, or? Oh, uh, she was very good to stay around and help. It was Aunt Lynn she was needed, was it? From Bunkerville, that was a midwife. One time that the uh, the Mesquite town brought a woman from Salt Lake down to train some midwives so that they'd have more than one. Uh, there was a woman doctor. I can't remember her name now, but she spent mm -hmm. about a month here in Mesquite training women. Uh, uh, midwife duties. <laughs> uh, that Abbott, that, that old home built by William Abbott, he traded uh, in Bunkerville for the doors and windows, he traded his farm so that he could uh, put the doors and windows in there and the brick were all kilned up here from uh, up in Mine Kiln. They'd bring the, the lime down, and the Fobbin brothers had that way of baking them so that they could make them hard and not just be dobies. It was quite a, quite a home for the time. Hmm. Had big gardens around it. Any other questions, anyone? Yes, way back there. The old Abbott Nichols, do you know anything about those? No, I don't. My brother, brother and sister, Melvin and Gladys, talked about that a lot, that they had those old Nichols. Did anybody else remember those? A token. Yeah, but right on it, it says a Nichols. Yeah, they, they did have their own, like I, they, they bartered a lot, and, and so you would go work and they would pay you in these tokens, and you could trade at the store with those. In Bunkerville, uh, Edward Bunker had them, uh, five cent, ten cent, and I think fifty cent. Uh, Kevin Nielsen has found some of those and has some. Uh, but it wasn't like you could take those St. George and spend them. They were only good <laughs> in Bunker's <laughs> store, and Abbott's was only good over here in, in uh, the stores here. I didn't know Jimmy Hughes' store. Jimmy Hughes's. It was, it was just more of a trade. Uh, you know, you come work for me, instead of giving me a check to pay you, I'll give you one of those tokens, and then you could go spend it at the store. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah, Lincoln, this was all Lincoln County until 1909. And then it was the, the county was divided into Clark County. And the one thing I don't think people know about Grandma either, and I didn't know this until my uncle Rosa Wigler from um, Santa Clara Ida told me, she was the meat inspector. And she said, no, I don't know if it was Grandpa and he just put you out of bed when I came. <laughs> <laughs> it was Grandma. <laughs> were you the meat inspector for the I town? I was the meat inspector, uh huh. What were your duties as meat inspector? Well, they had to have it stamped if they brought it from Utah into Nevada. And well, if you I bought a beef to, up there. I had to, to inspect it. And Roosevelt Goobler was one that always took meat to, to Vegas, you know, to sell. Uh -huh. He'd stop and have, I'd, it, have, you I'd have to stamp it. And How was the meat packed? I mean, was it in ice? or? It was, no. He'd, be, he'd come <laughs> sometimes at... Three o'clock in the morning to get down there while it was still cool. So it'd just be fresh just meat. Just be fresh meat. Laying in the back of the truck covered with yeah. a tarp or something. And covered with a sheet or tarp or something. I don't know. But <laughs> 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 I, 
I'd have to get out of bed and go out, go out and inspect the meat. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you do that? Oh, for a long time. I don't know. I guess till he quit taking <laughs> <laughs> Take me to Vegas. <laughs> I, I sh that's one of the things that I'm very thankful we have is refrigeration and cold. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to make a comment that as a child, I would come here to visit my grandparents. Uh, they used to have Christmas where they would call water. Yes. <laughs> and also, I remember these big, tall trees. It was actually when, how, can you remember when culinary water, you know, actual water from a spring in the mountain first came into your homes? Yes. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> all of the men had to work, you know, work, put in so many hours, so many days mm -hmm. on, on bringing it down. From, from White Rock? From White Rock, uh-huh. Or before that, all of your water, if you drank water, you got it from... The ditch, the irrigation, the river. The river. It uh, would, uh, and these cisterns that she's talking about was just a big cement. It was cemented a big hole in, you know, like a well. But it was uh, cemented and it would hold water. You'd fill your cistern up in the spring when the the, the snow water was coming down. It would, wouldn't be quite so hard, and it'd last most of the summer. Uh, then we'd have to fill it with virgin blood. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my dad hauling water from Beaver Dam, a spring up in Beaver Dam. He had a big tank, and we did that quite a bit. There, there was there was people who hauled it from White Rock, people who hauled it from uh, uh, Lewis Bottom, and people who hauled it from up in Beaver Dam. Mm -hmm. But it was so time consuming that uh, most often it was just a, a cistern. That was very special to be able to get any water other than. And that wasn't until, golly, we didn't have drinking water in town until the 1940s. 45. Yeah. So it's not that long ago. <coughs> yes. Virgin bloat. Yeah. Virgin bloat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, they probably would trade if you could get it. You would too. <laughs> I, I, and I do remember they used to talk some of them into putting desert air in their tires before they went across the desert. So, <laughs> just for a joke. <laughs> okay, one more question. Margaret Hazel, do you have anything you'd like to say before we close? I don't know. I feel like I've said quite a bit. I don't. It's been fun. Well, go uh, ahead. I'd, li I'd like to say how we had our we had to dip our drinking water up out of the ditch and fill our barrel. Then it, you know when it settled, why? That's what we'd drink. And you're 94. I'm 94. <laughs> Maybe we all ought to start drinking. <laughs> well, thank you, two young ladies, for being with us tonight and sharing your your thoughts and memories, and for you for for asking questions and there's lots of pictures here that you can come up and look at and talk and visit until this guy over here says you have to leave. Thank you. Can't leave till all the cookies have been eaten. <laughs>